Hello and welcome to Crime Watch Daily Updates. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. On the outside, Paige Bergfeld had it all. Good looks, three beautiful kids, and a large house in a small town. However, she and her husband had somewhat of a tumultuous relationship and they eventually split. Paige then reconnected with her first husband. On June 28th of 2007, Paige drove back to her home in Grand Junction, Colorado, from Denver, where she had been visiting her first husband. Then she just fell off the grid. Her family reported her missing, and the next day, investigators discovered her car burning in a parking lot. Search crews found some of Paige's belongings along the highway, but she was nowhere to be found. Police suspected she had been kidnapped. Detectives also uncovered a bombshell behind Paige's sweet appearance and those oval glasses and that red hair. She owned and operated a high-end escort service called Models, Inc. While sifting through her phone records, detectives learned Paige had received three phone calls from a mystery man named Jim, whose real name is Lester Ralph Jones. And it just so happened that Lester worked across the street from where police found Paige's burning car. Detectives looked through Lester's workplace and found some suspicious evidence, but there really wasn't enough to charge him or arrest him. Then in 2012, five years after she disappeared, a hiker found a skull in a dry creek bed. The skull had duct tape around the jaw and the head. Lester was arrested in 2014 and in September of 2016 went to trial. The jury couldn't unanimously decide on a verdict, so the judge declared a mistrial. Prosecutors retried Lester and in December of 2016, he was convicted of first degree murder, second degree murder and second degree kidnapping. He was sentenced to life in prison. Lester appealed his conviction, and in June of 2022, the Colorado Court of Appeals upheld his murder conviction, but the court determined the kidnapping conviction should be merged with the murder. That change won't impact his sentence because he will still serve life in prison. Let's take a look back at the brutal killing of a young mother whose two lives merged into one tragic ending. She raised kids by day. Paige was a soccer mom. And peddled fantasies by night. Hello, you've reached Model Inc. But this loving mother's double life caught up to her, leading to a shocking disappearance. Sorry, Mom, you are really, really mean. You said you would be back when we were in Why would you have been back? She would never have not come home. A bounty of suspects. I don't kill anybody over sex. And a mystery that would take nearly a decade to unravel. We were still stuck with the reality that we didn't have a body. Paige Bergfeld, a 34-year-old mother of three young children, was living the picture-perfect life. Paige was one of those people that just exuded happiness. When she showed up, you knew she was gonna show up with a smile because she just had that in her all the time. Paige was always very big about having her family on display. She would just be radiant when her kids were out playing. She loved family. Oh yeah, yeah, then her kids were, were everything. Her husband, Rob Dixon, came from a wealthy family, and settling in Grand Junction, Colorado, Paige enjoyed a caviar life in a corndog town. He was wealthy, so they bought the house in Grand Junction and then added to it. But according to District Attorney Dan Rubenstein, paradise was not without its troubles. They had somewhat of a tumultuous relationship. He would get angry, he would yell loudly, he would make uh, you know, threats or statements that would cause people to be very concerned. As the couple's finances grew more strained, Paige's father, Frank, was concerned for his daughter's safety. Dixon is uh, a person that's kind of two personalities. We think of him as good Rob and bad Rob. Um, and at the first part, it was 100% good Rob. And uh, I think as his financial situation deteriorated, we saw a lot more of bad Rob. She had told me she was very concerned about something bad happening. 
In October of 2004, Paige made a distressing 911 call. 911, where's your emergency? Um, my husband and I were in a fight. He wanted the children to stay with him, and he said that I would come home and find them all murdered. What's your name, ma'am? Paige Dixon. The situation was diffused by police and no charges were filed against Rob. But a year later, Paige placed a second call claiming physical abuse. After the second incident, I set up a bank account. It was getaway money. I wanted her to be able to pick up and leave with the kids if she needed to. After eight years of marriage, Paige and Dixon divorced. But now she faced the burden of maintaining that luxurious lifestyle on her own. Paige was enormously entrepreneurial. She started out by setting up this little series of dance studios for kids that she called it Brain Dance. And then she went into Pampered Chef and was taking trips for awards, so she looked like she was doing well there. She had another business where she was selling these slings for nursing mothers. So she was cobbling together things. She was one of those people that could juggle an incredibly full life and yet still be there with her children. She had a pretty nice house, I think 4,000 or plus square foot house, and her three kids slept in her bed with her every night. That's really who she was. She had quietly begun a romance with her first husband, Ron Beigler, a high school sweetheart she briefly married after graduation. He was the first big love. Ron and Paige kept in touch and uh, started rekindling their relationship. Beigler lived 250 miles away in Denver, so the two arranged to meet halfway at a rest stop in the town of Eagle. On the day she was last seen, Paige Bergfeld left her million dollar home here to meet with one of her ex-husbands. Sadly, the young mother would never be seen again. Thursday, June 28th, Paige and Beigler enjoy a picnic lunch before she begins the two-hour drive back to Grand Junction around 7 p.m. By 11 o'clock that night, she still wasn't home, and her young kids were growing distraught. You can hear the worry on this voicemail. Hi, Mom. Even her first ex, Ron Beigler, was growing distressed. When Paige still wasn't home the next morning, he makes a call to the Grand Junction police. Dispatcher for Clint. Um, yes, I need to talk to you about um, a missing person emergency. We really have very little sense of exactly what happened. What we do know is that her kids were expecting her home. They ultimately reported her missing on that Saturday morning after leaving countless messages for her. Um, her first husband, Ron Beagler, was leaving messages for her. Hey, Mom, you are really, really mean. You said you would be back when we were dark and you haven't even been back yet. We're really... Yes, Neil, please call back quickly. Frank gets a call he can still remember as if it were yesterday. And he said, are you Paige Bergfeld's dad? And I said, yes, I am. And then he said, did you know she's missing? And I said, if she didn't come home, even a night, you're dealing with a crime. This isn't a missing persons matter. This is a crime. Page is 7.20 on Saturday. Give me a call on my cell phone. Stat, bye. She would never have not come home. There was nothing ever in her life that would cause her to just pack up and leave her kids at home. They meant so much to her. We never assume that's going to happen, and we never assume it's going to be me. Police Investigation 101. Start looking at those closest to Paige. They're everyone's a suspect, and ex-husbands immediately are right up there. Detectives seek out Ron Beigler in Denver, Paige's last known contact, and the same man who made the initial missing persons call. Well, he was the last one to see her, which made him a person to talk to. Phone records indicate he and Paige called each other on the drive home, with Beigler's phone pinging cell towers in Denver, 250 miles away. The last call was made by Paige at approximately 9 p.m., saying that she was pulling into Grand Junction. And that was the last phone call she ever made. 
Her first ex is quickly eliminated. So cops turn their attention to Rob Dixon, Paige's second husband, who was now living in Philadelphia. A lot of people thought that Rob was the most likely suspect just because their breakup was, was not the most amicable. What was their breakup like? Uh, there was a misdemeanor domestic violence case reported. You know, I, I think that sort of volatility led a lot of people to think that he was part of this. The last time Paige's close friend Barbara Campbell saw her, Paige confided that she had an ominous feeling. She was really upset with something, and she was worried because she felt that something bad was about to happen. Paige Bergfeld, a mother of three young children, is missing. Police want to speak with her embattled ex-husband, Rob Dixon, a man accused of domestic violence before their divorce. You know, a lot of the leads that we got were, were related to him just because their breakup was, was not the most amicable. But Dixon was also one of those making distress calls to Paige's phone. Paige, if you get this, please, please call somebody. Please come home. Please tell us that you're all right. Everybody's worried about you. Everybody's looking for you. Please, Paige, let us know that you're okay. Police quickly confirmed that Dixon was in Philadelphia during the time of her disappearance. So what and who was Paige so afraid of? Police begin looking more closely at Paige's phone records and make a shocking discovery, one that will turn this case upside down. In addition to her work as a dance teacher, representing pampered chef and pushing nursing slings, Paige Bergfeld was selling sex, operating a secret escort business called Models, Inc. Hello, you've reached Models, Inc., Colorado's premier gentleman service. Stunning news to friends and family. He said, almost as an aside, did you know she was operating an adult business? To which my response was, I'm not sure what that means, but no, I didn't know. Investigators wrestle with the reality of what could be a very large number of suspects or maybe even more secrets. Given that she was living a double life, both as a pampered chef saleswoman and as an escort, how do we even know she's dead? Uh, because she could have just disappeared. But then, on Sunday, July 1st, three days after Paige went missing, that theory goes up in smoke. Hi, I'm at the corner of 23 and Logos, and there is a car on fire in the parking lot. Paige's car is found torched. When did you realize that you may not have her anymore? I would say that when I saw the car and seeing it burnt, you knew, you knew we were in a bad spot. While any physical evidence appears to be destroyed, detectives do make some interesting discoveries. For instance, the driver's seat is all the way back, even though Paige is only five foot four. When an investigator of similar height sits in the seat, her feet can't even reach the pedals. They also found Paige's day planner in the trunk, which somehow wasn't burned. However, the last four days of entries are torn out. Was someone else driving Paige's car? Someone much taller? And did they remove any evidence of their name from Paige's records? Unwilling to give up hope, the community of Grand Junction rallies around the Bergfeld family for a massive search. And we probably had 150 people that first day, a day that was over 100 degrees, and people were there, who none of whom I knew. I didn't live in the community, and it was an overwhelming display of uh, just community spirit and people who care for one another. The search hits pay dirt along Highway 50, just south of town. A veritable trail of breadcrumbs with Paige's fingerprints all over it. 100 volunteers out searching found a 15-mile stretch of Paige's personal items strewn along Highway 50 here, just south of Grand Junction. It's very difficult to know what to make of the strewn items. They also weren't the type of items that Paige would throw out unless she really needed to. They were blank checks on her business account. They were her kid's medical card. Was Paige kidnapped and trying to tell searchers where to find her? Tracking dogs were brought in and alerted to Paige's scent, but the trail ended at a riverbank with no sign of Paige. Investigators needed a break, 
and they were about to get it. One of the first things we did was look at the phone calls she had made the day she went missing. The last call Paige made was to her first husband, Ron Beigler, at approximately 9 p.m. But she also received several calls from potential clients of Models Inc. Yeah, this Motel 6, room 237. I was just checking to see if you had somebody coming out or not. Thank you. Another one of those calls to Paige, or Carrie, as she was known at night, was from a man named Jim, who called while she was visiting Beigler. Hello, yeah, this is Jim, just calling to see if uh, Carrie was available tonight. Turns out Jim called Paige three times the day she went missing and twice the evening of June 28th, but all these calls were made from a prepaid track phone. Police trace the number and find that it was purchased two days earlier on June 26th at a local Walmart by the man in this surveillance video. Detectives finally managed to find Jim, whose real name is Lester Jones. And get this, he works across the street from where Paige's car was found burning. That track phone and its entire history only had five phone calls to or from it. And the first phone calls were placed from it to Paige's uh, Model Zinc phone. And the last one was back from the Model Zinc phone to, uh, to that track phone. And after that, the track phone went dead. It never made another phone call again. A little digging reveals that Jones was convicted of first degree sexual assault and kidnapping back in 99. He's also a big man, six foot five, the kind of man who might drive with a car seat pushed all the way back. A week after Paige Bergfeld goes missing, the search for suspects has narrowed down to this man, Lester Ralph Jones, a man convicted of sexual assault against and the kidnapping of his ex-wife. And told her he was going to take her out to a lake, uh, kill her and bury her where nobody would ever find her. Have a seat. Officers are anxious to have a little chat with Mr. Jones. Does it bother you at all that somebody's missing? And you know that somebody to be involved in this service. And you know you use the service. Yes. That should. Sure should. Her car is found a stone's throw away from where you work. Does that bother you? No. Doesn't bother you at all. Okay. Her car is found torched a stone's throw away from where you work. That doesn't bother you? No. Does it make you nervous that we may think you did something? What Lester doesn't know is that cops are at this very minute searching his workplace and talking to his wife. Seems she was out of town the night Paige went missing. On the week of June 28th, uh, Lester Jones was uh, first out of town on the weekend prior to with his wife uh, in California, and then he came back to Grand Junction and she went on to Georgia. And how about three nights after Paige's disappearance when her car was found burning? What'd you do the rest of Sunday last? Uh, I don't know. I mean, we, we hung around. That's, okay. that's it. Okay. Actually, that's not it. All right. Um, I have investigators out talking to your wife. Okay. Okay. Um, what'd you do Sunday evening last? Went to bed. Mm, incorrect. Okay. Um, Les? I need to be able to tell this family, these little kids, where mom is. Good, bad, or indifferent, they need closure. Would you not agree they need some closure? I would, yes. Okay. Jones finally confessed that he left the house Sunday night between 9 and 10 p.m., the same time Paige's car was reported on fire to take care of a task at work. Why'd you leave the house Sunday night? To shut the shop lights off. How long were you gone? minimal time to come down and go right back. Why would I? Uh... The search of his workplace, a local RV shop, reveals more startling evidence. Well, at Lester Jones' workplace, he had a whole host of items, uh, such as handwritten notes about other escorts, what their bra sizes were, what type of sex they would have, if they would have sex at all. He also had the track phone packaging uh, for the track phone that was used to call Paige. He had um, bras that happened to be the same bra size as Paige. 
Other suspicious items include a stash of Viagra, two male wigs, and a food scale from Pampered Chef, Paige's employer. Uh, there was also a gas can uh, that was found at his work workspace that his uh, boss said was out of place, that shouldn't have been there. And that space is located about 500 yards from where that car was found burning. Yet during a second interrogation, Jones continues to deny any wrongdoing. I never met Paige. He even denies that he's the man in this surveillance video buying the track phone. I know for fact you were meeting models incorporated because you called and set an appointment with that track phone. No, sir. Yes. Explain to me why the track phone is in your trash at your workspace. I have no clue why it's in there. How did that get there? I don't know. First, he denied being at the Walmart at all. Then he said he was there to buy a soda. Ultimately, when shown the picture, he said he was there buying a monster cable. How did your picture get on a video at the very same time the track phone is being ordered? I can't tell you that. I was in Walmart and I bought a monster cable. I bought monster cable even though the receipt comes back to a track phone. I did not even buy a track phone. Even though the clerk remembers you at a track phone. I did not buy a track phone. So video's lying, clerk's lying, receipt's lying. The seeming nail in the coffin? Track dogs are taken to Paige's car and alert to the scent of Lester Jones in the front seat. Did you guys go for a ride? Did you go up Highway 50? No. Did she throw this stuff out? Well, how did no. stuff get up on Highway 50? I, I didn't. I haven't been anywhere with this lady. So much evidence, yet no definitive proof that Lester Jones was responsible for Paige Bergfeld's disappearance. Now, everybody who knew her knew that she was a very devoted mother and knew that there is no way she would ever leave her kids. But convincing 12 people beyond a reasonable doubt um, at a jury trial that she's deceased and that we have the right person was just too much of a challenge. This 34-year-old mother and part-time escort went missing in 2007. Nearly five years later, there was still no arrest in her disappearance, although police had a strong belief that Lester Ralph Jones was their man. I didn't touch Paige. I did not kill her. I have not hurt her. They had suspicious items at Jones's workplace. They had Paige's torch sedan across the street from his job. They had surveillance footage and phone records that showed Jones was the last one to contact Paige on a prepaid phone that no longer exists. Yet there was one key piece of evidence that left this convicted felon free. Uh, the absence of the body certainly uh, muddies that water. In the spring of 2012, that muddy water finally gave up its secret. A hiker was exploring a dry creek bed 60 miles south of where searchers had found a trail of clues laid out like breadcrumbs. Paige's personal items, such as checkbooks and clothing, scattered along Highway 50. A hiker in the Wells Gulch area just happened by a human skull, and when they unearthed it, it had duct tape that was sort of around the jawline area and around the, the back of the head. A team of forensic examiners soon find more bones strewn across a mile stretch of the creek, and they quickly determine that they do indeed belong to Paige Bergfeld. Even after all this time, it's a devastating blow. I would tell you without a doubt, uh, a piece of me, I mean, in terms of my emotions, a piece of me is missing. Part of my life is gone. There is no possibility of having her in my life again. For prosecutor Dan Rubenstein, the crime scene paints a gruesome yet incomplete picture. The reality is, is we don't know exactly how Paige died. What we do know is that she was kidnapped. And we know that because of the items that were strewn down Highway 50, and we know that because of the duct tape. Uh, you don't duct tape a person who's already deceased. And ultimately, through a mountain of circumstantial evidence, we're able to determine that uh, Lester Jones was the only person who could have done it. After years of not knowing, Paige's family was finally able to look at her accused killer in the eyes at his trial. But the jury was about to surprise everyone. 
In September of 2016, Jones catches another break. Believe it or not, it looks as if he may walk free again. It's a hung jury, nine to three, in favor of guilt. But the dogged DA wasn't about to let this case go. I think a lot of DAs with a less spunkin' backbone would have said, you know, well, why don't we wait and see if some new evidence comes in and duck the case. What made you so passionate about this? Every life matters, and it bothered me the idea that people might think that because Paige uh, had this double life that she didn't deserve justice. Please rise for our jury. In November of 2016, Rubenstein takes another shot. His first witness, Paige's daughter, Jess. Now 18, she was the child who left tearful pleas on her mother's voicemail nine years earlier. Hey, Mom, you are really, really mean. You said you would be back when we were dark and you haven't even been back yet. When was the last time you saw your mom? The last time I saw my mother was on June 28th, uh, before she went to work. She said that she would be back around dinner time. My mom was a very kind lady. She, she did everything for her kids. We even, we all slept in her bed in her bedroom because we just all love to be around her. Jones's wife, a reluctant witness, gives key testimony about the night Paige's car was found on fire. Did he leave at any point Sunday evening? Yes, he did. Did he tell you why he was leaving? He uh, had to turn off the lights. He thought he had maybe left them on at the shop where he worked. Was it suspicious for you when he left that evening? Yes. Can you explain to the jury why that was suspicious to you? I had suspected him of um, other women, and I thought he was going to meet someone else. Another damning tidbit came from a recorded phone call between police and Lester Jones regarding his impounded vehicles. One of the big surprises that came out of, of this investigation was a phone call that went from uh, then Sergeant Art Smith who was trying to return his vehicles uh, to Mr. Jones and he placed a simple phone call and what Art was trying to figure out was how do I get these vehicles to you? If you need us to bring one to you or come and pick one of you up, we can do that for you. I don't think so. I'm, Mr. Jones, I'm not following you. He asked me for I would bury a body. I'm sorry? You asked me where I could bury a body. When did I ask you that? The jury had a question at one point during their deliberations, and the question was, can we hear that phone call again? And when the closing came, I, I thought there was no doubt that Lester Ralph Jones murdered my daughter. And I've been informed by the bailiff that our jury has reached a verdict. After five weeks, the moment Frank Bergfeld has been waiting nine and a half years for. Jury verdict, count number one, charge of murder in the first degree felony murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, Lester Ralph Jones, guilty of count one, murder in the first degree. The sentencing is just as satisfying. Life in prison. It was unbelievable elation that he was really going to take the blame for this and that we had an answer. I'd say this is a life that God put on the earth that he absolutely wasted. And frankly, it would have been better if uh, they had skipped his name when uh, God decided who to place on earth. He has contributed nothing and all he is is a burden on society. It really was, you know, a, a case that took many, many years to put together. The highlight of being around Paige was seeing how radiant she would be around her children. When I'm around her children, I feel this elation, but then it's like checked because I realized she isn't here to appreciate it.